Well, uh, it's my great pleasure to announce this, the next uh, and the last keynote speaker of ELEX. Um, uh, well, we you probably all know Wendy. Um, she's been coming to ELEX conferences uh, several times. Uh, she's worked for various publishers, um, Random House, uh, HyperCollins, and she's Longman. Now, uh, yeah. Uh, yes, and she's now at Cambridge. Um, and she will continue the theme we ended up on yesterday, so talking about AI or chat GPT and uh, uh, new things coming to lexicography. Uh, and uh, she came from the States. Uh, uh, I have to say that some people, you know, the jet lag seems to be a common theme uh, at the conference. We have people coming from Asia and we have uh, people coming from the States. So. Um, I'm really happy that uh, Wendy is today uh, with us to give this talk. Thanks, Ichak. Good morning, everybody. Ah, come on, you have to be like Americans. Good morning, everybody. All right, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to say something um, provocative. Content is not the future. And let that sit in for a second. Content is not the future. So that statement didn't come from me. It is a quote from uh, someone who, like everyone else in publishing, is losing sleep over what artificial intelligence means for the future of publishers or many content providers. So uh, before I tell you what I think about that remark, um, let me answer the question that might be top of your mind um, for anyone who's read my bio, and that is why did they invite her to come today? Because I'm not a computational linguist. Um, I'm not an academic. Um, but I am someone who is lucky enough to still be working for a publisher with an active lexicography program more than 30 years after my interview with Michael Rundle, uh, when I could see a quick concordance behind his right shoulder. And I looked at it and I was like, what, what is that? And can I play with it? So um, I still delight in a good deep dive into the corpus. Um, but it turned out that what really held my attention um, was the business of dictionary and reference publishing. I just love the process of creating products that actually meet people's needs. I love the uh, research, the development, the marketing, the sales, and most especially the strategy. So I think the reason I'm here is that our honorable hosts suspect that um, I just might have a few thoughts about what the role of an online dictionary which if you want to be reductivist about it, is simply a whole bunch of content, um, could possibly have in a future where lexical data is mere fodder to train AI models on. So uh, as one of a vanishing breed, which is the head of an in-house dictionary team at a publishing company, I do know a little bit about survival uh, and reinvention and wresting opportunities from threats. So why, yes, I do have an opinion about whether content is the future. And at least as far as making money off of lexical content is concerned. And that is that to say that content is not the future is both utterly true and complete nonsense. Right. So, to start with, let's uh, all admit that AI has been around a while, and other folks uh, at this conference this week have made this point. Um, it's been various applications, and um, you can see a demonstration of it right here when I just tried to go just to see what Amazon would do. Um, it tracked me, right? You experience AI every single time you order from your favorite online retailer at every stage of your purchasing journey, right? From the suggestions for the other things that you like based on your search to the chat window that helped answer your questions 
to the communication with your credit card company at checkout, to the warehouse inventory management, to the routes the truck drivers took to get it to your porch. So it may be unnerving that Amazon knows where you are because you can tell it, it knows I'm in the Czech Republic instead of Seattle right now, or that the ads on Facebook seem to know the kinds of things you've been buying online lately, because they do, but it probably hasn't made you feel like your very livelihood is at stake. After all, for both for-profit companies and open source developers, they've been using generative AI with large la language models for a while, right? Among them, Google's Bard, Microsoft Sydney, on others that, that do or do not use open AI's chat, uh, GPT-4, right? In the generative pre-trained transformers. But um, all of that changed in, uh, no on November 30th, uh, 2022, right? And what happened on that date? Chat GPT was released. So pick your metaphor for this open source to generative AI application. It's the genie you can't put back in the bottle. It is the Pandora's box that you cannot shut. What ChatGPT has done, which until then these other applications hadn't done, was to put generative AI into the hands of the public. Right? So you don't have to be a programmer to use it. You don't have to pay anything to use it, not even a small monthly uh, subscription. All you have to do, and it's not necessarily all you have, it, it is a, it's not as simple as it sounds, but all you have to do is learn how to frame your prompts to get the kind of answers that you want out of it. So I wanted to shout amen at the panel yesterday when, when um, Avri Tavast made that same point, right? That the whole difference is this has been put in the hands of the public. So people are gleefully generating content using this bot. And bot sounds so innocent, doesn't it? <laughs> it's really not, not for me. It's, they're doing it faster than regulatory agencies and legislators can keep up. Just this past month, a lawyer in the US was sanctioned and fined for submitting a court brief that he had chat GPT write for him. And he was rumbled because the bot made up six cases that don't exist. It made them up. So for those of us whose business is providing answers to questions that people look up, that's the difference between the AI that has already been implemented in myriad ways in commercial and personal applications and the AI capabilities that are now possible. Generative AI isn't just synthesizing what it's been trained on. It is generating content that sounds utterly plausible and confidently so, but is untrue. This is also a point that several other speakers have actually made at this conference, as well as at the DSNA in May and Asia Lexids is just gone. So it is now a material threat to content producers because we know that people largely do not bring their critical thinking skills to the act of consuming information on the web. Right? So, of course, all of us who do lexicography are worried about how well chat GPT can do our jobs, right? And in the last month, there have been papers, a lot of papers that focused on, you know, can chat GPT be a lexicographer? Can it do lexicography? What are the results that you get? But for a publisher, what I want to know is, will my customers think this bot is better, that meets their needs better than my product, right? How much of a threat is an AI chatbot to my business and what can I do about it? So I'd like to invite you all to participate in that analysis today. Um, what you see here on this slide is a classic tool for strategic planning that we use to assess market conditions and to plan our response to them. It's called a SWOT analysis, which is an acronym that stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And it can be applied broadly to entire market segments or to narrowly to a single competitor. 
It's pretty straightforward. You identify the factors that belong in each category, and then you plan the actions you will take in response to them. So today, I'd like to apply it to generative AI, but specifically to ChatGPT, because its availability to pretty much anybody makes it more of a threat to those of us who want people to pay for access to information, even if it's only by visiting a site where I'm going to show you some advertising. All right. So I'd like to invite you right now to use whatever you're taking notes with, if it's you know old-fashioned analog paper or it's your computer, um, if you'd like to just draw this quadrant down. And as I'm talking, think about what you would put into those different quadrants. Because sometimes you can think, well, is that a weakness or is it just a, a, is it a strength? Is it a weakness or a threat, right? So just take a moment, draw four squares, put SWOT at the top, and then come along on the ride with me. And we'll, we'll be doing our strategic analysis together. So I'm going to get things going. And I'm going to add the fact that ChatGPT is easy to use to the strengths, and the fact that it can make stuff up to the weaknesses quadrant. Right? And I'm going to also put in its plausibility and the fact that it's free under threats. Okay. And I'd like to step back for a moment and describe the competitive landscape for in dictionary producers as it stood on November 29th, 2022, just before ChatGPT was released on the 30th. I'm focusing on the online dictionary space and particularly on free dictionaries because ChatGPT is online and it's free. There's a lot more that could be said, a whole nother talk about the subscription model and what the, the Oxford English Dictionary does or does not have to fear from ChatGPT. Uh, but I'm focusing on you know, where we're trying to uh, still have people come to find quality content on, on the web. So here you see some familiar names of these companies, and I chose their thesaurus page headers uh, for reasons that will become clearer in a little while. In the late 1990s, the market for dictionaries was disrupted and transformed forever when publishers started putting their reference online for free on the, and supported by advertising. At, as Google then emerged as the dominant search engine just a you know, few years after that happened, the focus of dictionary producers was on search engine optimization. How do you get Google to serve up your dictionary's answer to what a word means instead of the competitor's answer? Competition used to be about being in the top results, above the fold on a page, if you think you don't have to scroll down to, to get your result. It was, and largely remains, all about what the search engine decides is best for users, which isn't always what is actually best for users. The tail of Google has been wagging the dog of product design. So about 15 years into the current century, it became evident to those of us who were still competing in that online dictionary space that Google intended to provide the answers that people were looking for itself. More and more often, if you typed in a query, Google offered you the answer at the top of the results page in its one box, the Google one box. So if you search for the meaning of the word now, the definitions that you see at the top of the page are likely to be from the content that Oxford licensed to Google, would have loved the income from that license. And if you get the answer you want, you never visit dictionary.com or Merriam-Webster or Cambridge. The ima this image right, of the results from a search for the word admit, it's a little bit small, um, but as you can see, Oxford's content is at the top of the page. And that's Google's one box at work. And I had to shrink the page to get the hits from the other dictionary sites so that you could see Cambridge and then Miriam just, just there. But um, they were actually below the fold. Okay, The only thing you could see was the results from Google's one box. So we at Cambridge and our competitors have had to focus in recent years 
on catering to users who don't start their query on a search engine, but instead have bookmarked us and returned to us because of what we provide that they perceive as unique. So this is following another strategic tactic in business, which is the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your revenue tends to come from 20% of your customers or products, so you focus 80% of your efforts on that 20%. For Cambridge, it's not quite 80%. About 75% of our site visitors are transactional. I come, I get my definition, I go. A plethora of free online dictionaries will do the same thing. They'll give you an answer, Google will give you an answer in the one box, right? So, and if all you want is a definition, and if you're like most consumers, you've probably never been taught to discern a good answer from a less good answer when it comes to dictionary content. The most you'll probably do in the way of shopping for a different answer from the first one you were served up is to look for another source if you didn't understand the results the first time around. You're not gonna actually know whether the results were true or not. If it's online, it's kind of like if it's in a book, it's probably true. And if it's online, it's probably true. And they will believe a blogger just as much as they will believe the Encyclopedia Britannica, okay? So what Google's not been good at, though, let's see if we can advance this. Ah, did I jump? Okay. Good, sorry about that. It, is, uh, it hasn't been good at helping people make choices when they're confronted with multiple meanings of a polysemous word. So in this way, it isn't very different from a printed dictionary. People who find a word proceed to start reading at the beginning of an entry, and you can see this uh, beginning of an entry for the word admission in the Cambridge Dictionary. They'll start at the top, whether in a book or online, and then they stop at the first definition that seems to fit. And if the word has a lot of meanings, sometimes that can take a while, and sometimes they give up. So this is why in the crop of dictionaries that were published in the mid-1990s, uh, dictionaries for learners in particular, you saw various approaches to clustering groups of related definitions under short semantic headings. You can see how Cambridge still does this. Here, shown here in the purple semantic headers under the entry for admission, with one sense under the first heading, but three under the second. So this made sense because unless a person's just looking up a spelling, they're coming to the act of searching for a definition with a context. And this is really important to remember, they are coming with a context. They have found a word they don't know and they know the sentence that the word occurred in. So we can see this in what learners of English type into the field on our website. They include words from the sentence that occur around the word they don't know, often with inflected forms instead of base forms, and with words that don't belong to the chunk because they don't recognize where a chunk begins and ends. We've been pretty successful at providing answers to our users by making collocations and idioms and phrasal verbs more searchable, but in many cases, a user still needs to scroll down an entry page to find the definition they want. So I've said to many people who come to us for licensing content, for typically for that one-click lookup where I'm going to be reading something and I want to click on a word and get a definition, that, you know, it's all very well if you want to license my data for your little pen reader, right? But what is the user experience of someone who's got to scroll through the answers of a polysemous word to find the meaning that they just click their little pen on or that they, they punched into their tablet, right? Um, the holy grail of lookup in those situations is finding the right definition among many for the particular context in which the user encounters it. Right? So the challenge for, for that uh, has been up till now that Every team of lexicographers at every single dictionary house is going to interpret how to account for a word in a different way. They're going to be lumpier or splittier, or you, so you would have to hand match with a lot of expensive editorial work any given reader, for instance, 
all of the words in it to the exact meanings that are represented by the, sentence, the words in these sentences, which you can do at a limited level for a course, for instance, but it's not practical to do um, if you're trying to have a dictionary help you just look up things on the fly the way that you used to just have your, your book next to you. So now I'm going to return to that SWOT analysis because as it turns out, ChatGPT can do this. It can provide the meaning of a word as it is used contextually in a sentence. So where would you put that in the grid? It's a strength for sure, but that strength is also a threat because it means that ChatGPT can offer something we cannot, right? So let's put it in the threats too. So as we've seen from all the, the really great presentations, um, discussions uh, the last couple of days, a lot of us have been trying out ChatGPT, asking what does this mean for lexicography? And I tested it out specifically to determine how helpful or not it could be to my core customer, a learner of English who was looking up a word in context and who wants to choose the right word when they're writing, right? So I'm, I'm asking, what does it do well that we could build into our products? And what does it still do badly? Because that is where opportunity could be too. Surviving in the marketplace is not just about responding to threats, but about creating opportunities out of them, right? By maximizing our own strengths, and exploiting the weaknesses of the threat. So let's see what it looks like when you ask ChatGPT to infer a meaning from a context. I decided to try the word admission, which I picked because it's polysemous, but not unmanageably so. And it has some interesting collocational behavior. If I go back to what the entry looks like on our Cambridge Dictionary site, with the semantic headers, right, that are meant to help a user identify the meaning that matches the content, um, I'm going to take the example sentences that are similar to the ones in the three senses that are clustered under the semantic header allowing in, right? And ask chat GPT what admission means in that context, right? So the three there. So the one I tried first was the sense to do with student admissions to college. And you can see that the explanation chat GPT gives is correct. Now, granted, it's way too much for a learner of English to read, and you're sitting there trying to read it at speed. Don't worry too much about absorbing all of this, but just you know, register the fact that it's wordy, right? But I can tell you it did correctly identify the right meaning for the right context. Let's try another one. This time, in the sentence, how much is admission, you can see how the bot is hedging its bets. It's saying the answer would typically provide the price or fee, but it isn't saying admission equals the entry fee, right? Which is what basically a dictionary definition would say. The higher level Lexus and the grammatical structures and the length of the sentences used by ChatGPT are also too difficult for many students, whether they are native Eng speakers of English or not. So what I'm going to do is then add a potential weakness to our analysis, which is that the answers are too complex. Right? Simple as that. So let's try the third one to do with admission to an exclusive event. So here again, chat GPT has given a correct, if wordy answer, that admission is a form of restricted access. All right. So just to show you the difference between these results and Google, I asked Google to tell me what the word admission meant in the sentence, admission was by invitation only. I knew to avoid using question marks because, or quotation marks because that would tell Google to only find an exact match, right? But the best that it could do, let's see, 
I'm behind myself. There we go. Um, it was to serve up dictionary entries that contained the phrase, leaving it up to, yeah, the user to start digging, right? And just for fun, here is the result for admit. Right? <laughs> just like, there's a lot of um, deeply guilty f people on chat groups, from what I can tell, admitting things that they were wrong about. So, okay, we've established that chat GPT can identify the correct meaning if a user provides the context. And if you can manage to wade through the verbosity, as a user, you might be more pleased with the result than you would if you had to scroll through a dictionary entry. But what about other aspects of the information in an entry, such as patterns and collocational behavior? For instance, we know that in the expression, by someone's own admission, some non-native speakers will use at instead of by. So I asked ChatGPT what it thinks about this. And it is notable that ChatGPT did not say that at his own admission was outright wrong, or as Michael has reminded us, uh, that Patrick Hanks would say not normal, as opposed to wrong. Um, it decided that based on the low or zero incidence of at in the data it was searching, the safe way to characterize this finding was to say that it was not common. So its response, that it didn't convey the same meaning as the normal phrase, could be taken to mean that it did have a separate meaning, just not the one that was as common. So I followed up. And I said, if you say they're not the same, how are they different? ChatGPT appears unable to make a value judgment, possibly because it found one lone instance of at instead of by somewhere. We don't know because what the bot has been trained on is a black box to us. The closest it can get is saying that it is not a standard English expression. So I didn't like how long, how uh, complex and long the answer was. So I said, please use simpler language to explain that. The previous time, the bot said that at his own admission didn't convey a specific meaning. So this time it said it doesn't have a clear meaning. So this is the closest we can get. And from a learner's point of view, it's probably fine just to know you should use by instead of at, but it sure took a lot of dialogue to get that answer, right? So based on that, I'm starting to look at my analysis and say, all right, we can see that ChatGPT accurately identifies the meaning of a word that is used in a specific context, even if its answers are too long. You can ask it to simplify the result and it will apologize and try to comply, but it won't be all that successful. So at this point, thinking about my strategy, I'm starting to wonder how we can harness that strength in contextual meaning identification to improve our search at the same time, exploit the fact that lexicographers can produce much clearer explanations. That would be good. We wouldn't be out of a job, right? But AI could help connect users faster to the relevant meaning in polysemous words. So it feels like it would be a lot of work to build, and we probably need a tech partner to do that. But let's record that thought in the opportunities quadrant. Are you still recording things in your own quadrants? So now another laborious piece of lexicographic work is teasing out the differences between our near synonyms and presenting them to users in a way that helps them pick the right word for the right context. It's not labor in the sense of, oh, this is mindless and boring. This is the fun, but it's a lot of work equals expensive, right? But judging by web traffic, this is a huge need and it's worth investing in because thesaurus.com gets more traffic than dictionary.com. 
Merriam-Webster has seen a boost in traffic following a recent revamp of the way that, it, uh, partly other things, the way its thesaurus works. And we at Cambridge have also found that our recent thesaurus work is more sticky, you know, content for us, the kind that users will spend time on rather than bouncing away the minute they get the de definition. And time on site equals money, right? So people who are writing in English, not just learners, often seek help with choosing le mot juste. But what people often end up with is just a list of related words uh, and that are not explained in relation to each other. And as we can see here, this is from a Google one box search result, again from Oxford's content. There is some semantic discernment happening because there are synonyms of the verb admit, which are grayed out because they don't belong to the same semantic range as the meaning in the example sentence. But if you click on one of the words, it simply goes to the definition of the word. There isn't any advice about which to choose for which context. Right? So just I decided to find out how good ChatGPT is at telling us a difference between similar words. And I chose a set of terms that we treat together in an article in Arthosaurus. Three near synonyms, admit, accept, and recognize. And then for comparison, appreciate. You can see I, we also have acknowledge in there, but I left that out just to keep things a little bit more contained. We specifically compare the meanings that have to do with admitting that something is in fact true, usually with some reluctance. So, My first prompt was just to ask the bot to tell me the difference between these words. And something interesting happened. Can you spot it? I'll give you a minute to read through it if you can. All of these are legitimate definitions of these words written more or less well, but none of them occupies the same semantic range, right? It seems to have simply pulled the most frequent meanings for each one. So as I'm sure most of you know, there's a button you can push to regenerate a response if you don't like the one that ChatGPT gave you the first time. So when I pushed the button, it revised this answer. And then it asked me if I liked this answer better than the one that it gave before. And if not, why not? I could choose that it was worse, that it was the same, or that it was better, right? Which is utter genius, because large language models require large amounts of input to train the algorithm. So by making generative AI easy to access, OpenAI has made every single captivated and tranced user a contributor of input for its algorithms to train on, right? Genius. So, anyway, here's how ChatGPT responded when I pushed the regenerate button. It learned that the first answer wasn't satisfactory enough, but in this case, it guessed that what it needed to do was to go looking for additional meanings. But its success in identifying the senses of admit, accept, recognize, and appreciate that all relate to acknowledging something a person might not have before is generally unsatisfactory. Its tactic seems to be to add more senses, but still collate them into a single answer for each word. So when it did this, it did manage to add the sense of accept that is about coming to terms with something instead of the sense of accepting a job offer, but the additional senses for recognize and appreciate still miss the mark. And the strategy of simply adding more definitions made the answers less clear, which if I have time, and I'm still looking to make sure that Chuck tells me I do, um, I'll do a little bit of a deep dive into in a little while because you probably have already noticed it. And you want to say, oh, these are terrible, and, and I would fire the person who wrote those. So at this point, I knew that I would need to take a different tack with the prompts if I wanted to give me a result similar to the ones in our thesaurus. Um, and there's a clear consensus among those of us who've been testing out ChatGPT that skill in coming up with the right prompts is really important. 
prompt engineering. So I asked it in the following sentence, what other words would work instead of admit? And what would be the difference in the meaning for each? And the sentence that I used was, he admitted that mistakes were made. And this is what I got. So it's very interesting to me that the second sentence in each of these answers gets closer to differentiating the subtleties of use by distinguishing the degree of admission of personal involvement. Right? So it's groping toward some differentiation there. But at the bottom of its response, the bot said it was important to consider how each word subtly alters the meaning of the sentence. So naturally, I asked it for some examples. And the happy bot said, certainly, and gave me a set of example sentences that are structurally repetitive and are essentially restatements of the definitions and lack real-world context to help learners model their usage on. Right. Didn't actually help with the differentiation that I wanted. So it concluded with a paragraph that reads an awful lot like it's trying to be a synonym essay of the type that one might have found in the American Heritage Dictionary or some of our learners' dictionaries. But this one just seems to be making distinctions without actual differences. I'll just let you read that for a sec. So if I'm looking at this from the point of view of somebody who is trying to sell a product, and I am, uh, then the speed and ease in getting to an answer is a huge factor. Anything that requires too much clever input on the part of the user will simply be rejected as too hard by that user, particularly for our users who aren't native speakers of English and are not likely to know words like culpability. So I am adding requires skill in writing prompts to the weaknesses of ChatGPT. I think we all might agree with that at this point. Now I'd like to go back up to where I was before. Am I doing okay? Oh, only 10 minutes, I gotta skip it. All right, so come back to me for the analysis of uh, what was wrong with all of the uh, the uh, definitions that ChatGPT generated were factually incorrect. They uh, made syntactic and grammatical errors. And so look, there's all of these beautiful analyses that you're just gonna have to ask me for a copy of the slides and I'm happy to send this to y'all. Because I ended up telling the bot that it was not very much like a definition for learners at all, and can you please do better, all right? And the bot, let's see, we'll just get through here, all right? I, I, gave, I got really angry at it. It's not like a definition for learners, and then it tried to come up with this, right? The definitions just kept getting markedly worse. There were errors, syntactic errors in every single definition. And so I'll be merciful and not delve into these in detail, but again, you'll be, you're welcome to come <laughs> and ask me for that. So my SWOT analysis of chat GPT relative to a learner's thesaurus is basically that um, we can add to our list of weaknesses that it makes syntactic errors and cannot deal easily with synonym differentiation. And here, in contrast, is our thesaurus article on the topic of accepting some, that something is true. And I encourage you to go to dictionary.cambridge.org and check it out. And I'd like to note that two key people who worked on this are here today, Colin McIntosh and Jessica Rundle. So, um, so based on these weaknesses, we might conclude that ChatGPT and its ilk aren't such a threat to clear authoritative dictionaries and thesauruses, right? Well, not so fast. Here I'm gonna quote from Grant Barrett's talk with his permission. Grant gave a GPT-4 um, 
which is the version that you pay for, you know, not ChatGPT, the task of defining the word Miros virus. And it replied, I'm sorry, but as of my last training cutoff in September 2021, the term Miros virus doesn't appear to exist in the English language. So Grant then asked GPT-4 to define Miros virus for a college dictionary, an unabridged dictionary, and for a scientific dictionary. It gave the same answers it had before, but then it said, you know, even though I don't know what a Miros virus is, I could show you the differences in those type of dictionaries if you just uh, want me to try it on the word virus, here's that for you, right? So the bot was able to scour a range of specialized and general resources and synthesize them almost instantaneously. And what Grant found was that GPT-4 copied most of the definitions wholesale from other copyrighted material. All right, take a look at that. I've used this with permission from Grant. So Gilles Maurice, I don't know if you're in the room today, you said yesterday there were no copyright issues with the output of chat GPT, but that's not true because someone cannot, by law, reuse content that may be legitimately licensed for the site where it originated, but isn't licensed for reuse. Right? The bot is pulling in content from places it does not have the right to because it doesn't have control over how people are then going to reuse what it is uh, collating. This is a serious threat to owners of intellectual property. Many dictionary producers have either put their content on the web or licensed their content to other companies, which in turn have used it in offerings that are on the web. And these licenses, these licensees may have acknowledged the source material with a copyright notice, but that has not stopped ChatGPT from seeming to take a toddler's approach to anything it can, it can crawl, which is basically, if I see it, it's mine. And by the way, Grant Barrett also shared that Google Bard successfully answered the same prompt for Miros virus without plagiarism and was able to identify it as a new class of viruses and found the journal in Nature that in 2023 that it had um, first been recorded in. Um, so how to prevent a freely available AI bot from crawling your website for content that is free to consult but not free to serve up in a way that competes with the IP owner is an urgent problem that will need to be addressed by legislation, I think, along the lines of the international coordination that we've used for privacy. So now we have a few other things for our, our grid. We have another strength, that ChatGPT is sourcing vast amounts of data and synthesizing it on the fly, and another threat that it seems to be getting that data straight off the web, and in some cases stealing it in violation of copyright law. You know, Grant's experiment is also another example of the point that, as Pavel noted yesterday, AI cannot generate a dictionary from scratch because it's not sentient, right? It cannot analyze data and draw conclusions. So its Achilles heel is that it is only as good as the data that it was trained on, and this includes the most recent data it was trained on. ChatGPT cannot define new words until it is trained on updated content, though it may well try to speculate based on what it knows about word formation or from any context that a user provides. So now we've populated you know, three of our four quadrants with um, several items, but opportunities is still nearly empty. So in my time remaining, um, this is where I want to look at the weaknesses and strengths we've begun to identify and ask ourselves, so what? How do we manage the strengths and exploit the weaknesses to mitigate the threats and make opportunities for ourselves? So publishers with storied brand names have the advantage of an association in users' minds with authority of content. But brand loyalty only works when users get something from you that they can't get anywhere else. The reality is that users of dictionaries are not the most discerning bunch. People want answers, they want them fast, and if a chatbot presents them with what sounds like a plausible explanation, will they know or care that it's off the mark, that it models poor syntax, that it is plagiarized? A certain percentage, which is people who will get a bad grade on an essay for using terms incorrectly, or someone who'll be embarrassed by using the wrong word in speech, 
They might be put off using a chatbot to learn how to use words after a bad experience. That is not a big enough user base to build a business model for the future upon. The bots are going to get better at providing clearer answers faster, and people value their time. Google was right about the one box, but that box has a vulnerability in that it isn't interactive. Google itself is now scrambling to catch up to the likes of ChatGPT as a one-stop shop for all answers. So the future is not, in fact, content. If by content you mean the kinds of definitions that were written for print books and then got put online for free more than 20 years ago. But that's not news. Google's been siphoning off more and more of those casual transactional users for years now. So the truth is, I have an answer no one else does, still brings users to your site. But my answer for what admit means is better than Google's answer only works for dictionary producer if people are bookmarking your site and spending time on it because you're adding value to the user beyond the quick question and answer transaction. It's not going to be any different, that landscape, when AI replaces Google. It is still the same problem. So let's look at those two areas of opportunity, having answers that bots aren't good at and adding value around the content. If we go back to the point that AI models are only as good as what they're modeled on, this makes them unlikely to be able to spot neologisms, let alone emergent or shifting senses of existing words. So therefore, the ongoing need to account for neologisms and new meanings is an opportunity for good old-fashioned lexicography. So too is the need for reanalysis of existing entries to account for changes in culture, as we recently did at Cambridge when we overhauled our terminology to do with what's known as EDIB, equality, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, including words to do with gender and gender identity and race and racism. But just having that cool new stuff isn't enough. If dictionary data sets are updated with active scholarship, and as long as intellectual property rights are adequately protected, dictionaries can attract sticky visitors by leading the public conversation about language change. Right? Not only by being the first to record such content and make it available, but more particularly by providing the community where the conversation about language happens on social media where dictionary brands have active followings. From a purely commercial point of view, if we don't support the mature product in that way, the channel will not thrive. And leading public discourse about language change is an important way to do that. Second, there is value in providing answers that users can actually understand. And not just understand receptively, but internalize so they can reliably produce more effective communication. So as we saw with my thesaurus experiment, chat GPT can synthesize, but it lacks the discernment of a lexicographer. It cannot do the analysis that creates value for our most lucrative users, the 20 to 25% who are looking for guidance in using words well, not just in what they mean. There is still rich work to be done in helping people with contextual word choice that is not yet well served by existing generative AI, but which we can harness AI to do, not just by improving the relevance of search results, but by improving contextual advice as users write in real time. And finally, AI can help users to curate their own experiences of online dictionaries so that the sites are no longer generic, but truly my dictionary. Users of the Cambridge Dictionary can already make and save their own word lists, and we're working with our partners IDM to increase the ways in which the site itself will help users customize the site for themselves. We have a window of opportunity right now when the sloppy, wordy, unhelpful results from GPT searches are poorer than what dictionary providers can supply. We can turn the principle of garbage in, garbage out to our advantage if we ourselves can train AI on our good content to retrieve information in imaginative new ways to improve our customers' experience. So this is my last slide. 
I just have a few final pieces of advice. This is not a time for the head-on strategy of trying to beat a threat by being a bigger threat, because none of us is bigger than AI. Identify a problem your user has and ask how AI could help you solve it better. People will pay for things that solve problems for them, especially if they have fun doing it. Second, use a flanking strategy while there is still time to do so. Flanking means that you play to your own strengths where the competitor is weakest. So bear in mind, it is learning all the time on a volume of input you will never be able to match. So your window for doing this will be short. So therefore, be very clear-eyed about the question of whether you do it yourself or buy it in, right? Recognize when you need partners. So as I say to my team, we are so lucky to be the people who get to reinvent what it means to be a dictionary in the 21st century. Why should we, all of us, not be the ones to use AI to solve the problem of finding the right meaning for the context that the user brings? We can disrupt the dictionary landscape by developing new ways of working that tighten the collaboration between lexicographers, computational linguists, and programmers, just as we did more than 30 years ago when corpus analysis transformed the making of dictionaries. And this is, whoops, I was actually doing the, the um, here we go, I'll go back. There's my points, people. I didn't realize I had done this. Take a screenshot. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for questions. Um, yes. Um, so I'm curious if you've looked at uh, like ChatGPT plugins at all and what your thoughts regarding those might be, uh, considering they're designed to allow ChatGPT to connect to the internet and more reliably pull from official just sources. I, when I talk about training it on our data and responding to the threat with the IP um, plagiarism, plugins have to be the way that we do that. You know, we're not going to have the engineering power to just um, replicate what AI has done. I forget who it was yesterday in one of the, the sessions said, look, it's already there and, and the work has been done, at least on English. You know, I think there's a lot of work still to be done on other languages, but for us certainly, um, we just need to camp on the back of it and to harness it and point it in the right direction. So yes, uh, when I talk about us trying to figure out what we're gonna do with it, plugins have to be the, the, the way if we're going to use GPT-4, right? But GPT-4 is like, it's not the only thing out there, right? So I think we need to look a little bit more holistically at um, the problem. You start with the problem first, and then you find the right tool to um, in the toolbox and, and whether one already exists or if you've got to create it yourself. Okay, do we have an, any other question? I can't hear you. Mm, please just go back to the previous slide. The previous slide. Thank you. That was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's somebody back there. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in your analysis that currently ChatGPT isn't usable for learners because the definitions are too wordy or complicated. 
did you try any slightly more sophisticated prompts? So just saying, <laughs> explain in a few words or explain in a few simple Yes, words yes, that was the is. bit I had to skip in the middle because I get, I, I get a little bit too uh, verbose. But essentially, um, I did try to get it to, uh, I'm gonna see if I can just get way back here. Um, I had tried, um, first of all, essentially just to, um, to get it to regenerate because I didn't like what it got and just hit regenerate to see what I would get. And what I found it was doing was adding things on without discriminating and then um, making it more verbose every that time and introducing syntactical errors into the results. So then I did say to it, um, that's not like a definition for learners, right? And I also uh, earlier had said, please explain it in simpler language. And it apologized and said, I'm sorry, here's something that's simpler. And it wasn't actually simpler. It was just wrong in a different way. Um, and so it did try to create, this is its attempt at a learner dictionary. And what you can see, I don't know if you can see what it's done, but it's essentially given an example sentence that is only for, um, it still is uh, agglomerating different um, uh, definitions within, let's see if this is the right slide. Um, yeah, to identify, acknowledge, or realize someone or something. How would you realize someone, right? Based on previous knowledge or familiarity, this may be not might not be the one, but one of the ones that it did was was having several meanings in one cluster, but then only giving an example for one of them. Um, and the syntax of this um, is is erroneous, right? And so if you're trying to do something for learners um, and to try to unpack it, this is the type of definition that um, we try to train lexicographers not to write, you know. Um, I think the one that you're, that Michael would have called a sackable offense. Yeah. I think, Gilles, you had a question. <clears throat> yes, just because you mentioned me, so I feel obliged to reply to that. But before I do that, I'm, I want to thank you. This is it's a perfect overview at the right moment. I think a number of us are now rethinking some of the things we claimed, and uh, that's why we are probably too quiet because you shone today. Wonderful. So thank you. Wow. Now, Thanks. Re replying, we'll, we'll give the proper applause at the end. Um, copyright. First, I don't think ChatGPT is supposed to do what you showed, but it did. So which kind of proves it's really a black box. And mm -hmm. that's why some people are really scared. We don't really understand what it is sometimes able to do. Yeah. But then, I often discussed it with the late Kilgarrick. What do we do with copyright? And his answer was always the same. If Google can get away with it, we can get away with it. So if Google, and Google has had issues and court yeah. cases, and some of the solutions is to pay publishers in the end. Well, this may be one of the answers then. Yeah. The chat, the open AIs of the future will just pay for, well, everything they steal. It, the difference between what ChatGPT is doing and what Google's getting away with is that Google still provides links to the sources, right? And um, what Google serves up is licensed to it under a legal contract by Oxford, right? And But I, I actually asked, one of the things I did with ChatGPT, I said, where did you get your definitions from? And, and it told me, and, and I, I forgot to make a slide out of this, but um, it basically said, well, it's from various sources, on the licensed sources on the web. So what it's done is it's decided that if, for instance, you know, I license some of the content on our site from K dictionaries, right, from Elon here. And what it's basically saying is, well, because I found your stuff on on your site, you know, I'm going to pull that in, and because you've licensed it, then I, it must be okay for me to use it too. So it doesn't actually respect the law that I can't turn around and sub-license it and sell Elon's 
content as if it were mine, but that's essentially the way that chat GPT is doing. So I think that's the difference, you know? That's why it's, it's, it's a material threat to in a different way than, than Google has been. And we have to be able to, to respond to that. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm afraid we ran out of time. Um, okay. So please, I would like to thank Wendy again. Thank you. Thanks. This has been wonderful. Yeah.